Hey everyone, this is Chris and Sandy with the Chris and Sandy Show. We get up close and personal some amazing guests throughout the entertainment industry. And today, like I said, every episode, we got a great one for you. Who do we have? We're excited to have singer songwriter Danny Stefanetti with us today, who recently released a new song called "The Timing Was On." We're going to talk about that and a whole lot more. So, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris and Sandy. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for all you guys do for indie music. Well, we appreciate, oh, appreciate it. appreciate that. Thank you so much. So we want to talk first about your song, The Timing Was On. Can you tell us more about that and what inspired that song? Um, yeah, I, I gather you guys have seen the music video. Did you enjoy the yeah. music video? We did, yes. Yeah, it, I hope it connects with a lot of people because um, when I perform it live, it's always been a really special song to me. It's just like it's not an upbeat song like my other ones on the record, but it's yeah. got that dreamlike cinematic, like it feels like it's in a movie kind of feel to it. And um, I wanted anyone that's like, whether it's a, a, a business opportunity, a friendship, falling in love with someone, a pet, if the timing was off by just a second, you wouldn't have met that person or a yes. cat thing. <laughs> and it can change your whole destiny. Absolutely. And I think like there's a lot of movies like Serendipity and that, which are about that kind of concept um, about time and how yeah. Yeah. that's why I mean, like, it's almost like they're in Times Square and all those people rushing by and then people can just like cross each other and not even know it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that song touched us too because we always talk about stuff like this. Because when we married, we we actually met on an online Christian singles website back in yeah. 2002 when it was kind of taboo yeah. back then. Yeah. But we, but basically, if the timing was off, we would have never met, as you said in the song. Because when we met, um, Sandy was only logging on to the site um, to to delete a message that was on there, and she yeah. was actually logging off when I said hi. I was. I had my oh. mouse over the X to, to log out. Yep. When and his message popped up high. And your name just popped up, and he, you know, you could have just. Yeah. That's amazing. To see, the time was on. <laughs> yep. It was on for us. And, and here we are, you know, almost twenty-two years later. Tw yeah. Twenty-two years from that point, but almost twenty-two years of marriage. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. And two kids. <laughs> Yep. Two kids later, too. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many, and there's so like even with the kids, you know, um, if the timing would have been different on anything, e even if you change a little bit through our story before the kids come, they wouldn't be here. That's true. Right. That exactly. And it's it's moments like that that we it, it's out of our hands, it's out of our control. And I look back as well on my life and go wow if i was off by i wasn't even in that city i wouldn't have had that happen or like, it's crazy yeah. but it's also cool as well isn't it when something good comes out of it so exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cause sometimes sometimes things happen for the bad and you're like man if i had to change that but then when it's yeah. good you're like okay i won't want to change it <laughs> yeah, i hadn't even like got out of bed today and like driven there but then you know <laughs> It's crazy. So I hope everybody feels like a magicalness about that music video that's set oh in Times Square with the, the visuals. And yeah, it was a really fun song to produce and put in the studio with um, all the strings and guitar layers and everything like that. Awesome. Love that. So um, when did you when did it click for you that being a musician could become a career? Um, well, I started playing guitar around eight or nine and I didn't ever think it was a career. I just knew that I was a bit of a, a daydreamer and like I was in this world, but I was kind of like always a little bit of a space cadet as a child. I don't know if that's changed too much either. <laughs> but I was like, not a big, not a big reader. Like I was just in my own little fantasy world. <laughs> <laughs> I was like always people watching like there could be a lot going on in my family and at Christmas dinners and things and I would just be like watching everybody you know and yeah. um when I found the guitar it was it just clicked for me it was like wow. that's something that got me out of my shell and then I started like 
meeting more people in television and the music industry. Like there were little TV shows in Australia called The Couch. And I was like meeting people on set and playing at little bars in Perth. And the more I got myself out of my shell, it was all because of the guitar. So yeah. I was like, this is wild. Like I was so shy in school. I didn't fit in. I didn't know where I fitted in anywhere. But when it came to the guitar, I was like, oh, my gosh, I finally fit in. And people actually like this. <laughs> you know, I get treated so much better when I'm playing guitar. <laughs> I kept doing it and these songs were coming out of me. And I was like, um, you know, some of them were like not the greatest, but then I started getting better at it and like learning Stevie Ray Vaughan and blues guitarists and trying to like perfect my art. I would go to my room and practice seven hours a day and slowly my high school grades started to decline because I was oh, focused uh, on yeah. <laughs> So I decided, I decided to leave school and go and do rock and roll, didn't I? <laughs> so, oh, wow. And move to America. Yeah. Yeah, I moved to America and uh, the rest is history and uh, no regrets, you know. It's been a wild ride. I met some great people along the way and I'm doing what I love every day and performing live is just, I knew it was for me when even at 12 I was like opening up for some house concerts and other artists and I knew that's what I wanted to be. When I saw a travelling musician play a house concert called David Lamont, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. just was like you know a little girl how she saw the koala just before I was just like in awe of this musician and I wanted to be him and I had to work out his songs I had to work out how he played so good on the guitar oh, wow. and I think that was my driving force yeah uh, you know a lot of people they see the glory and what an artist go, goes through because they only they only see one side of it, but they don't see the grind the sacrifice the tears the struggles it takes to make it at any level so let's take a moment because I always like to talk about both sides of it. Tell us a little bit about that that rise of trying to grind it out. Um, so um, when I actually when I left school, I was um, I was going through the rounds of a TV show, and mm -hmm. I didn't get on, but I thought it was I was going to get on, you know, like further in the show. Yeah. So yeah. I, said, I said goodbye to school, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so not only did I make this dramatic exit in my high school, like, hi, everybody, see you later, guys, bye, you know. <laughs> like, it didn't quite work out. So, you know, I little did I know how difficult the music industry was, but yeah. that didn't stop me either because I started making opportunities and I made my first EP at 17 and I was recording even from the age of 12 at in, making my own four-track, eight-track recordings. But um, when I left school, I started playing at any place that would have me and my dad um, became my road manager and yeah. he would travel from Tamworth to Sydney to Melbourne, anywhere that I was playing shows. And he was like my security guard, my dad, my road manager, <laughs> my um, he helped me driving and different things. And we saw it all. And some nights I'd play to really big crowds opening for an artist or there would be, uh, I'd have to do a, a three hour set and just the bartender and my dad were there. And it was depressing because like, I kept trying these TV shows or trying to get exposure. And then I kept getting knockbacks for years. And it was like disheartening because like, I, I Straight after that would happen, someone at my show would be like, hey, you should go on The Voice or like a different TV show. And I'd be right. like, oh, you know, I tried. <laughs> you know, I don't know what else to do. You know, I'm trying my best. But people were so loving and maybe the timing just wasn't on then. Like, yep. I think for <laughs> sure. Love the time. Like, I don't regret auditioning and trying, but I've changed so much. Like, yeah. I, like found my sound and what I want to put out there and I think it's all part of the journey looking back but I mean me and my dad had moments where I come out of the gig and because there's so many highs and lows in this industry mm -hmm. yeah. it's like when you have an exciting like you get like an opener for a big artist or you get like an award or something like really good that comes about every year or so or even yeah. after a couple of years you get one of those big highs um 
like if you're going through the lows for too long, it starts getting really annoying. Like you start <laughs> really down on yourself. <laughs> like what am I doing wrong? And um, I think when you pick yourself up, like just around the corner is usually something good that's to come. That's what I found. Yep. And, you know, talking about the TV shows and all that, how many of the big artists have said as they made it big where they'll finally admit that, yeah, I tried out and they didn't even pick me to go through first round. <laughs> <laughs> and yet they still, that's yeah. just like, yeah. And that's just like, I remember the story of Gabby Barrett's dad. He, um, um, he, he used to say that they were devastated when she didn't come in first, she came in third. But yeah. then as time went, he oh. learned that when you come in first, they control every bit of your life for five years. She okay. didn't have that control. So because of that, she was able to blossom and actually yeah. um, become what she is. And he yeah. said if she would have won, she probably wouldn't be where she's at. Yeah. I think everybody has a different journey. And that's sometimes what's good for another artist might not yeah. be good for you. Exactly. So it's like got to trust the process and that wasn't my road but I'm thankful for it, like at least being involved and getting a shot at it yeah. um but now I've made my own shot because as an exactly. indie artist like I reach out to radios and 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 me and my manager at Danny Land Records we've kind of made our own luck you know and we produced the whole album just the two of us and right. it's got elements of John Mellencamp Cheryl Crow kind of it's got four layers of drums and bass and like I played well I, I uh, obviously program in the drums but I played all the other instruments and yeah. added in strings from the presets and things but you know in this day and age you really can create what you want to put out and go straight to the fans instead of having anything in between and that's what I kind of I prefer that like I, I think it's kind of like just is more organic that way yeah. And that's what's and that's what's great about social media. Even though social media is kind of double-edged sword out there, the good mm -hmm. thing is you can go to the people where where 10, 20 years ago you couldn't. Yeah, and we were counting on I need to get our exposure, and now our exposure, whether you're a book writer or a musician, is is this. It's yep. YouTube or a, a Facebook or Instagram. We go straight, our videos go straight in front of the people that are into our style, which is really cool. Love that. <laughs> so what keeps you going through the tough times? A lot of tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Huh? So you can know that. And um, I love animals. And I, I'm out here in California. I'm in the California desert. And I was living in Los Angeles. And... Mm -hmm. and fun city you know lots going on because but I'm a beach girl I'm from a small town in Perth so I am used to a chill way of living where so LA was uh, very very fast for me to like comprehend but I like it out here in the desert because it's like more of a chill again <laughs> and um yeah. that keeps going what keeps me going is is uh just having a bit of faith in this is my purpose this is what I was born to do. And knowing that I get to do what I wake up every day and do what I love. And, and that keeps me going. Yeah. I love that. And you're going to play a song for us, aren't you? Yeah. Right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so this is the acoustic version. Oh, well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Got to figure out that setting. I was trying to put you on. Um, that's funny. <laughs> that setting got of messed up there. It did. <laughs> it was supposed to go for. Um, huh, we'll just go on. I guess we'll keep it yeah. like that. <laughs> so this is the acoustic version of The Timing Was On. And I hope everybody watching connects with this song as well. Great. I don't know what it's like to tell you my heart and tell you my life. I don't know what it's like to be with you now 
and hold you tonight. I'll try to write this song, and maybe I'll go another day. Maybe you'll hear my song playing on the radio one day. But if the time it was up, but just one second. Is the timing was on hey. Now I know how to laugh When you're not far away You're here with me, babe Now I know who to call If my world fell to pieces Oh, you catch my fall I'll try to write this song Maybe I'll go another day Maybe you'll hear my song And all of these feelings will stay But anyway If the time was up By just one second Love it. Yeah. And like I said, Matt, when I first heard the song, we I, could definitely. I, 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 had, I was like, Girl, you got to listen to this. See if it reminds oh, you of us. Yes. I'm glad that, that people are connecting with it on a personal level because that's what it's about. That's what music's about. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Because that was something that, you know, we, we always talk about when we tell our story and all that, or if we're talking to each other, we always talk about those moments that, could have changed everything, you know. So it's so it was really cool to hear it in words. It was. Yeah. It's almost like looking back on the good memories. That's what that song reminds me of. Like, yeah, yeah. exactly. That moment in time, it was like an epiphany. <laughs> yeah. Now you now you know. Um, uh, and Jeff says, "Excellent." Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> now, as you know, a lot of people they see you. And it feels like you do everything, but we both know that it takes teams. Well, even if you have one a team of one or have a team of 300 people, it doesn't matter. Yes. A team is a team. So I always exactly. like to give the artists a chance to just talk a little bit about the team that kind of helps them do what they do. So tell us about your team. Well, my, my team all started from my mom and dad. 
So my dad, you know, all those hard yards through the outback, through Perth, my dad just doing the nightly gigs together with nothing in it for him except for is my dad and he's trying to like help his daughter and believes in my gifting. And my mom was at home back in the day where she was like sending out CDs to radio stations oh, and competitions. You know, she was putting them in the post. So oh, that was where Danny Land Records started. And then fast oh, yeah. a couple of years and um and I'm not a kid anymore. So <laughs> and then fast forward a couple of years and um, I met my American manager, Jeffrey Panza, who's worked with so many big artists, including uh, all the way from Nally, Lil Wayne, uh, Wilson oh, wow. Phillips, Indiari, awesome. uh, Three Doors mm-hmm. Down, and Stevie Wonder, a lot and a lot of others. And he discovered me playing guitar online, and um, oh. Oh, wow. I actually missed his message for a couple of months, and I finally got back to him. <laughs> And I wasn't looking for a manager or nothing at the time, but it turned into that. And, um, you know, every day we just work at this. And he's kind of helped me build um, a loyal group of beautiful friends of mine that basically go out of their way to make videos, graphics. I would say it's about like 10 to 15 people that um, weekly uh, push my music and help me along, yeah. and, um, my little koala team. <laughs> <laughs> Close. And um, yeah, it, it's just amazing to watch people take the ball and run. And I'm not even like, like asking them to do it. They're just yeah. literally yeah. at the radio stations or get me on a, a TV program. And they're trying to carry the music out there. And that's what it's about. And um, so yeah, I've got a bit of a, there's a long list. I don't want to leave out anyone, but like Jerry Pans, a William Lee Golden from the Oak Ridge Boys has been really supportive. Oh wow. And um, a lady called Epic Roxy and Angel Wings, uh, Mark Hudson, um, Donna, Jim Crabb, and there's a lot of people that share my music, Caden, um, Kate Staten, and other indie artists as well that have been really supportive as well. So I love the community on Twitter. That's where I found most of that support. Oh, wow. And, and uh, yeah, I, I just feel like it's happened organically and it's catching on. I'm starting to get bigger shows, the biggest That's I've ever good. had in my career lately. And um, it's nice to, like, it's a slower build without a major label, but, yeah, I've definitely got, like, a strong. Slow but and small. steady. <laughs> hey? S- slow well, and steady. Yeah, slow and steady wins the race, right? <laughs> exactly. Because yeah. you, you want endurance. You don't want to shoot to the moon and then fall Mm -hmm. yep and um so i'm thankful for the people in my life that are friends but it's so encouraging of what i do and i can't you can't buy that it's just it's beautiful it's a great thing to have you know speaking of teams we have a third co-host our little chris yeah, he likes to come and ask a couple. Yeah. He actually likes to come on, and ask a couple questions. Oh, so Sandy's going to go get him. I'll get him. And while we're waiting for him to come in, kind of talk about what's next for you. Yes, um, I <laughs> am just in the process of getting Danny's Diamonds, my new record, printed. Now you got me thinking of you, and um, that last song, the timing was on, is off that album. So I'll let. Um, anyone that joins my mailing list, you'll be the first to know. Um, if you go to dannystefanetti.com, you'll be the first to know when that album is available to purchase. And um, what else? I have a very big um, show coming up in May for a very big rock and roll artist, but I know it is until it starts getting advertised. But I'm the opener and I am just chuffed because whoever this is, is very amazing and um so that's coming up i just recently played at the indian wells tennis garden at this stadium one and i got to sing america the beautiful and that was a huge honor especially for an aussie girl so um america has blessed me with opportunities and that i am forever grateful because making a move out here was scary but like i'm starting to see all the fruits of it and i'm just blown away so now you're starting to feel okay. It's actually starting to pay off. Yeah. It's it's taken a couple of years like to like find the right um, you know, team and, and all and the right music and all of that coming together. But it's finally starting to move quicker than it was. And yeah. you know, 
that's like, um, I know you're not in Nashville, but they call Nashville a 10 year city because a lot of people come and they think they're going to make it big overnight and it, it doesn't happen. It's about from the moment you move to Nashville to the moment you make it is usually on average 10 plus years. Yeah. I would say I put over 10 years of hard yards in Australia. I was like, I didn't have that time. Like, i got to get started right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I gave I this is coming on the fifth year and um oh, yeah. we I'd say the last two years since I got management things have mm. accelerated very Oh that's quickly. awesome. Yeah. A team helps. It does. It really does. You can't do it alone. Hello. Hey. What is your name? Christopher. Christopher. So we've got Christopher Jr. here. Yep. Yes. All right, hey Danny. So what's your favorite food? My favorite food? Um I love fruit. I love like papayas and pineapples, but I also have, <laughs> I love black olives for some reason. <laughs> and mine is pizza. You like pizza? Do yes. you like it with pineapple? The Hawaiian? Pretty much, pretty much everything on it. <laughs> everything? Oh, amazing. Um, Guess what? My brother is called Christopher as well. So <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> crazy. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite car? My favorite car, I'd probably say like um, a Chevy or like one of those old fashioned Elvis Presley cars, you know, like in uh, Baby Blue yeah. or the baby pink ones that Marilyn had. Yeah, I don't even know what brand they're like Mustang. <laughs> Mustang. Mustang's yeah. awesome. Yeah, good fun. Yeah, mine, mine is 1970 Corvette. Oh, that's that's nice too. <laughs> Maybe and like a brand. Something. And he wants the Pro Street style where it's got the big engines that come out and all that. It, <laughs> so he wants something that's probably about 80 grand. <laughs> wow. Well, one day, one day, Chris. Yes. <laughs> all right. Bye. That's oh. all my questions. So bye. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. <laughs> He's into his cars, I can see from the shirt. Yeah, and, and well, we do another show or, or another brand called the Customized Ride. Uh -huh. And so, so we go to car shows and stuff and film the cars coming in and the cars that are there. So, and That's that crazy. brand took off. I mean, we in like 18 wow. months, we went from zero to 200,000 followers and 100 million video views. Wow, congratulations. That's huge. It just exploded. And and, and, you know, so we're trying to build two things here at one time, which is tough. But you know what? When your passion is both things, you, you do what you got to do. I'm sorry. Uh, the gardener just started, uh, but it should go down in a second. I'm sorry about that. I'm <laughs> Can you hear the gardener? <coughs> no. Okay, good. <laughs> I think that some background some background noise streamyard pulls out from it so that yeah. might be why i didn't hear now granted pretty loud maybe on maybe on other on phones and stuff maybe you can hear i don't know but through my computer i didn't hear it well everybody that, that's watching it's live this is live tv right here <laughs> it's like, there is no changing right <laughs> so if you could co-write with any artist dead or alive who would it be and what song would you want? What what kind of song would you want to um, collab with? That's a really good question. I haven't been asked it like that before. I've been asked that duets, co-write with any artist, dead or alive. Oh boy. Hmm. I'm just trying to think of like my very favorite. Oh, I would love to. Um, I would love to be in the studio in the same room as Stevie Rayborn. I think that would be surreal. Um, and I, I would love to do a co-write with Joe Walsh from the Eagles and he is still living. And that, that would be a pretty, uh, a pretty cool moment if I could get that one day. <laughs> <laughs> love that. Yeah, one, of the, one of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say is one of your craziest moments that's happened to you in your career so far? I would say that, um, like the backstory behind this march when I got to play at the Indian Wells uh, Tennis Garden for the, the BNP uh, Tennis Open. That was um, probably my most surreal moment I've had in yeah. my whole journey because I was playing an event upstairs, like at the same place, but like to a smaller crowd. And I got a call from my agent at like midday 
um, hey Danny, would you like to sing America the Beautiful in the like between the matches? And it was like a really big tennis player. I don't know if you follow tennis, but Carlos, I don't know how to say his last name, but um, you know, Serena Williams and all were playing at the oh, yeah. Open. And, but this day um, they, they asked me at 12 and my gig was at 2. So I had like to basically <laughs> learn the song before 7.30. And I said to my agent, sure, I'll do it. Like, yeah, of course. <laughs> It's beautiful, yeah. I don't know it, but I'll learn it. He's like, Are you sure? I was like, Yeah, yeah, lucky I washed my hair today, you know. Um, and um, and, and luckily, I had my guitar, and my outfit like, what I had is what I had because prepared, right? The traffic, like, everybody that was at this tennis open, I said yes to the opportunity. And then after I finished my show at about four o'clock, I, I started trying to learn it, and um. <laughs> And like memorize it and i said to the sound guy i said oh can i put the lyrics on my arm or like in front of me he said no 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 it's getting televised it's going to be drones and that you got to memorize it <laughs> and he said oh by the way on your last note we're going to put the that's when the fireworks are going to go on and i went where are you putting me he said in the middle of the stadium i went oh you know i didn't want to be that girl that that's on bloopers, you know, that forgets yeah. the lyrics. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that is one way to ruin your career, you know. And um, yeah. I thought, you know, worst comes to worst. It, I'm, I'm not American. I can always, like, in the middle of the song, start playing a solo and go, hey, good night, I'm from Australia. I've got the rest. Can you guys sing it for me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of ways, but I ended up getting it right, thank God, because you just, oh, once you lose one word, of the song mm -hmm. you, you you're you're lost yeah <laughs> in America, beautiful you know <laughs> so it went, it went really great and that was a highlight i would say because it was you know the stadium sixteen thousand people and i was like whoa wow. that was okay. that was really fun and such an honor because that song is so special <clears throat> so what's your favorite song of yours um, probably some that haven't been released yet. I'd probably say like the timing was on and um, a couple of my older songs like Moon Looks Pretty Tonight and You Make Me Beautiful because that one's dedicated to my granddad. So I got, and, and 17 Stars, it's probably one of my favorite original songs. So what is your songwriting process? Because I know talking to a lot of people, the process is a little different for each person. So what's your process? Yeah, basically my process in songwriting is not having a process. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Just let it come, yeah, right? Let it come naturally. Yes. So yeah. the more I think about it, the worse the song is. <laughs> the more that. I just, the more I have a cup of tea, pick up the guitar, and I'm just feeling it, and something mm -hmm. kind of comes out. Or even if I'm in the middle of a show and I'm kind of jamming on something, I'm like, that's that's a cool this is gonna be a song and I start writing it on the, the spot they're usually the best ones I've noticed and, and you know that that's like for this show I, I can relate totally I have like a base set of questions but I try not to learn too much about the guests I'd rather it come out naturally yeah exactly and there's something spontaneous about that whether it's songwriting or an interview because it it allows that room for a bit more fun. Like it just, yeah. you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to come out. When you restrict yourself, that's why like, I find in co-writing even, like I'd rather just finish the whole song and then have someone fix up a few bits and bobs on it than like, because I've missed that magical moment. Whereas when it just comes out, it, I find I really like them. But then when if you put me at seven o'clock tomorrow, you're going to sit down and write a song. Oh, God. <laughs> that ain't then me. You, you know, then you get the brain freeze. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm the exact same way. Yeah. I love to have the conversation. And, you know, when, when we start the show, even though, like I said, I do have a base idea of where I'm going with the show, for the yeah. most part, I don't know where we're going to end up. Because many times we take a turn and like, okay, I didn't know see that coming. <laughs> exactly. 
even when I'm performing live, like I have a set list, uh, you know, a few pages long. And, yeah. and I'm a bit of a, um, I'm a bit of a, when I perform, I, you know, I'm a little bit, um, I, I usually find my cups, <coughs> My, my set list, everything's kind of out of place by the end of the gig, right? I make a mess <laughs> of the area because I'm so into it and it's like one, my cable, you know, or my, my pedal board's not where it first was by the beginning of the show. <laughs> and um, I find that that set list, even though I write it, it ends up going totally different depending yeah. on whatever I feel on the day. <laughs> So what advice would you give someone who wants to do what you do? Just I have a little faith in yourself and trust the process. Don't put too much pressure on yourself in the early days because like with me, it's taken a lot longer to start. And I'm still every day finding what's working for me and what isn't. And I think don't be too hard on yourself because when it comes to the arts, like nothing is right or wrong. You just got to like, do what feels organic to you. Yeah. And I think that will connect with people. Um, when you're just like, love, when you love the song, people are going to love it too. That's what I believe in. So what is a question that you wish people like us would ask, but we never do? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I think you've you've got all the great questions today. I don't think there's any you've left out. I really like that one that that the one you said, dead or alive. Who would you want to uh, write co-write with? I thought that was a great question. I haven't heard that one before. So, and what would be your dream venue to play at? Um, well, I'm not there yet, and but we all got a dream, right? And I would love to play at Madison Square Gardens one day in New York great one yeah because i put it in my song so i i, I that means i gotta make, make it happen absolutely yeah. so, yeah. so love, love that so as we clo close out here any final words well i want to thank you guys for having me on your show and um also like listening to my taking the time to listen to my music i'm really grateful for that and connecting with the song the way that you have um i I treasure that and it was nice to hear your email when we were co corresponding about getting me on. You said you guys had a little story behind that song too. So <laughs> I, I was really looking forward to hearing what it meant to you as well. So I love that. Well, we appreciate you we coming do. on. Yeah, we and tell, tell everybody how they can find you. They can jump over onto my website and if you're wondering why I have so many koala bears, it's because if you want to become one of my koala fans, um, you can. You can join my like mailing list. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I have all my albums, everything on my website and my tour dates and all my upcoming news is over on the official website. So come over and say hi or follow me on Instagram, all that. Love that. Awesome. So anybody that's been watching to this point, please like, share and subscribe and hit everything that you need to hit social. We love y'all. <laughs> And we'll see you on the next show. Yeah. Thank you guys.